Good evening and welcome to the uh, City Council meeting for Tuesday, June 15, 2021. Let the roll call reflect that all council members are present. And we have council member Hire who's joining us electronically. Uh, first up, we have a Pledge of Allegiance, and that will be offered by uh, Vice Chair White. Thank you. Next up, we have recognitions. The first is the Juneteenth Freedom Day, uh, and we have uh, Luis, who is offered to read that point proclamation. Our council will this. Sorry. Yes, Chair. Oh, uh, uh, Miss right Betty Sawyer was here to share right for this recognition, and she'll be right back. Uh, can we go to the yeah. next item and wait for her? We'll go ahead and okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, item B is the Luana Lou shirtlift recognition, and we have Vice Chair White who's offered to read that for us. Thank you, Chair Blair. Um, there wasn't probably one person on this chamber here that would that wanted to read this um, as much as I did. So I appreciate you all letting me have it. So this is the Ogden City Council and Mayor proudly recognizing Awana Lou Shirtliff for providing invaluable contributions to the Ogden community. A public servant of the highest caliber, Awana Lou Shirtliff dutifully served the Ogden community in a wide variety of capacities, ranging from a longtime teacher at Ogden High School to the District 10 representative in the Utah House. For nearly 30 years, Lou served the youth of Ogden in the classroom teaching English, accounting, and business. It was her love and dedication to education that led her to a career in politics as she set out to increase funding for public schools and teachers. Lou served in the House of, Utah House of Representatives for 10 years from 1999 to 2008 and from 2019 to her passing in 2020. During her tenure in the House, she was instrumental in passing of many education bills, bills that help protect domestic violence victims, among many others. In addition to her service as a House representative, Lou was heavily involved in the Ogden community as she served on several boards and communities as she strived to make Ogden a better place. We are saddened by Lou's passing and offer our sincerest condolences to her family, friends, and other close associates. Lou represented Auden with class and integrity, and we are confident in her legacy will continue for many years to come. Presented on this 15th day of June, 2021. And I believe the family is here. You're Stacy. This could be our first picture post COVID here. Yeah. Our first picture back. Yeah, come on up. Go ahead. Thanks for being here. I was one of those accounting students. <laughs> I was, yeah. She was. Oh, I don't have a footstool over here. Made it here, so we. There we go. There we go. Okay, let's hear one, two, three. Is it? Stacy, we'd love to hear from you if you want to say something. There's a microphone right there. It's down there. It's up to you. I don't know. <laughs> okay. 
want to thank the people. Well, I don't know what the words. Um, I don't really know what to say other than how much and how deeply I know my mother loved Ogden and loved the students and how valiantly she fought for them. Um, there's so many stories. I mean, I just, me and Scott roamed the halls of Ogden High, <laughs> helped correct many accounting papers and English papers, and I watched her fight for those students and and for and, you know, build them up and get them to work and and it, it was nonstop at our house. It was an Ogden High house and an Ogden City community. And she didn't. It didn't matter what, if it was the kids that had a lot of money on the hill or the kids that were down on Wall Avenue. We were in the car and she would stop and and boister them up all along the way. And we were very proud of her and. And she worked hard for the community, and I'm very grateful that you have honored her in this way. It would mean the world to her because Ogden meant the world to her. And we thank you again for everything you've done for her and and for the legacy that she left. I know that she was well remembered as we have cleared out, cleaned out the house. We just have found letter after letter from students and her constituents and artwork and beautiful things that have been left for. 50 years from different people that have, that who she has touched that we didn't even know about. Stories have just continued to come out from the love that people have sent to her. So we appreciate this honor and know that she is well deserved. So thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Chair Blair, if, yes. if I might, um, I worked with Representative Shirtliff at the legislature for many years. Um, representing Ogden City, and I have never found a more kind, compassionate bulldog in all the world. And when we asked her to do something, she went and fought for the city uh, time and time again. It was a privilege and an honor to um, be able to rub shoulders with her and see what an amazing person she was. And I just want to say thank you to the family. We absolutely enjoyed her, and we're so sad at, the pass, at her passing. But boy, even even last year, she was a champion for us on many bills that we we needed her help on. And she would come find me if she had a question, and then she'd come find me to let me know that what she was able to achieve. And she just was an amazing person. And so I I thank you and honor you, her her family. Thanks for thank that you. privilege. I'd love to make a comment. Please. Yep, that's okay. Um, I just wanted to say, um, you know, I just admired um, Lou so much. And I, um, over the past couple of years, I got to know her a little bit. But her influence is just so powerful, whether you were a close friend or just met her in passing. I think she treated everybody equally, like, like you were best friends all the time. I just think that, you know, I think that... Uh, Vice Chair White and I both received an award in her name, and when I received it, I thought there's no possible way that I could ever live up to Lou, but I was so honored uh, to receive that award, too. So um, there's, I think her legacy will go on for a long time because of the inspiration she gave many people. I always thought that she liked me better than other students. That's why she passed my, because <laughs> a lot of those times I thought, I'm not sure if I should have got the grade I got in that class. But now that I know that you were correcting those tests, um. I feel like maybe that's why I passed that class a little higher than maybe I should have. So I do thank you for that. But I also, uh, um, she was always Mrs. Shirtliff to me, um, always. <laughs> and when I first signed up to run for city council and going through that very first um election process, she was one of the first to reach out to me, and she was so valuable. Um, I, Like I said, I had her as, as an accounting teacher, um, but she actually became, through, through city politics, we actually became very, very close friends, and I appreciate everything, as both, both as a teacher and as a mentor and a friend. She was very great and always there for me, and, and she taught me so much. So I do appreciate her. I agree with Councilmember Chaburka. Her legacy will go on for so long because she's, she's done so much, and she's, she's touched so many people on, in so many different ways. She's really been someone to, uh, uh, someone to really fight for, for everyone. And, and, and she did that, and I think that will be her legacy. So, again, thank you to for you for being here and, and, and for everything that she did and has, has done for us. So I don't know if there's any other comments. 
No. Um, I just you, didn't know how much. I, I don't know how much time she must have had. She must have had twenty eight hours in the day because <laughs> I don't know how. Just reaching out to us and mentoring us and pushing us along and and yep. still having time for family. So. <laughs> Okay. I I don't see Betty again. Do you want to It's up to you, Chair. I, I, I would recommend that we hold up a little bit. I'm, I guess you'll be back, but it's up it's up to you yeah. if you if you okay. wanna if you want me to go. We have ahead a couple requests to be on the agenda. Should take a couple minutes. So why don't we go ahead and move on then we'll go back. We'll okay, okay. Back. Thank you. Yeah, yep. Her belongings are still there. So. Okay. So we'll go ahead and move on. Um, we have a or we have a request to be on the agenda, and the first will be the declaration of moderate water shortage. And we have Brady Hurd here from the water utility. There he is. There he is. Well, good evening, um, Chair and members of the Council. Um, as mentioned, my name is Brady Hurd. I'm the Water Utility Manager for Ogden City. Um, yeah, so as it states up on the slide, declaration of moderate water shortage. Um, as you, I kind of want to draw your attention back to December of last year. Um, we had gone through and done um, a conservation plan that was adopted, and as part of that plan, um, there was a water shortage management plan as part of the, that conservation plan. And so with that and with the limited snowpack and um, precipitate, the limited precipitation that we've received this last year, um, we are now activating that water shortage, water shortage management plan. So with that, um, I just kind of want to give a recap as to kind of where we're currently at with water. So with that... That does not. You're good. Okay. So current water status. Um, so right now, there's multiple things that we look at to to kind of measure this. Um, there's uh, we look at obviously the Pine View Dam, which I'm, I don't know how many of you have been past Pine View Dam, but that's looking pretty bleak um, for this year, being that there's a lot of shoreline that's exposed right now, as well as we, we watch our wells and our drawdown and if and when there is any drawdown in those wells. Um, and then um, with that, we, we also look at the surface full water supply index, which is um, data that's provided from the USDA through the Natural Resource Conservation Services um, Department. And so with that, this is some of the data that is provided in that report, and this is a, a monthly report that comes to us. So as you can see, precipitation is 46% of average. Um, seasonal accumulation from October to May is 46% of average. And then soil satur or sorry, soil mat moisture is lower than what it was last year. Um, and then the average temperature, I think today's probably a prime example of how, how hot it's getting out there and it's irregular from what we've experienced in the past. And so with that, there's gonna be some temperature stuff that we'll also discuss just briefly. Um, and, and then obviously, oh, sorry, there's the water availability index, which currently based on all the data and um, that's, that's been put together, the Ogden River sitting in the fifth percentile and the Weber River sitting in the, in the 30th percentile. So as of May or June 1st, um, the Pine View Reservoir was sitting at 56% um, capacity compared to last year, which was 92%. Um, currently, I, Pine View is looking to shut off secondary irrigation first, of, first week in August. So um, with this, this is the same data that's on that slide that you just saw. Um, just trended out on these graphs. So you can see um, the Ogden River precipitation. Um, you can see the blue line is the maximum um, that's been recorded in data. And then the green is the normal. And then the red is going to be the minimum that's been recorded throughout history. So, or well, over several months. So um, with that, you can see we're, we're the black line that is trending just above the minimal. And then... Um, you can see shifting your focus over to the right-hand side, the Weber Ogden River soil saturation. So 
beginning back in October, we were well below the minimum of what's been recorded. And then as we got into spring this year, we were, were trending just above that minimum, as you can kind of see. So we kind of made up some middle ground, but we still got a long ways to go. So yeah, we need some precipitation majorly. So with that, um, here's some of that temperature data that we just covered also. So you can see there again, the black line is just hovering between the, the maximum and the normal. Um, obviously it's elevated temperatures on, um, yeah, the rivers. And then as you shift your focus to the right, you can see the soil, soil temper, man, the soil temperature is also higher. Um, and why we wanna keep an eye on this is when it comes to a treatment standpoint on um, Pine View Reservoir, as we get cooler nights and then hotter days, it causes turnover in the reservoir, which makes it really susceptible to allergy plumes. And so with that, that comes into, it can potentially complicate toxicity in the water and the water, to, water quality and how we go through and use that into the treatment system, into the plant. And so if and when we get into allergy season, which we're already experiencing some turnover, or we're gonna be experiencing more here in the next bit with all the temperatures we're experiencing, there is a potential of forcing an early shutdown of the treatment plant. So um, just wanna be, yeah, very transparent on that, that there's, it is a concern um, as, with the limited shortage of water as well as the temperature. Can so, I, oh, I was just wondering, can I interrupt just yeah. for a second? For a quick, so when you say that shutdown of the water treatment plant, so what does that effect, effect or who does that impact? So yeah, what, what would end up happening is so it'd be, the quality of water would become so toxic in a sense to where we can push it through our clarifiers and then ingest it into the treatment plant. We don't want to damage the treatment plant. And so with that, that would be, we'd have to cut back drastically citywide um, and depending on if our wells um, start showing some, some type of indication of stress or fatigue and drawdown in the water column, that's another contributing factor that we would probably have to consider as a city, how, how we, we cut back in a sense in, in addressing that. And so, yeah, I mean, it, the treatment plant is a portion of, of how our, our water production is delivered to the city. Um, we have wells, we have Pine View, as well as we, we buy some water from Weber Basin on the south right. end of our town, or sorry, of our city. So it's, it's across Chair the Blair. city as a whole in a sense. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I, Brady, when do we normally uh, turn off the, the uh, treatment plant? What, what month does that normally happen? So yeah, it's gonna fluctuate from year to year, but a typical season would probably be around the 1st of October. It really is dependent on demand and the, act, the climate and, and what is being dealt at any given year. And so, but yeah, generally it's about the October time is when we shut down production for the treatment plant. So, so that's, yeah, it's a super huge concern of ours and we're just, we're trying to get ahead of as best we can. We're trying to get chemicals and everything and, and then just keeping track of, of temperatures. So with that, um, does that answer your question? Yeah, and I apologize okay. for interrupting. It just disturbed me a little bit, so I'm trying to okay. <laughs> wade through that. Okay. So, so how many, how many uh, wells do we have up there? We've got six wells at the Pine View, like on the peninsula that's just out on the east side. And then we do have one well that's up on the top of 27th Street, which is a smaller well uh -huh. um, for a development up there. And then we do have another well out by the airport that is still under construction. We're hoping that that'll be able to come online towards the end of the season, which would probably help facilitate some of our industrial and commercial out on the west side of, of the city. So the, uh, are all the wells uh, drawing water then, or are yep. some that are not? So we, we haven't seen really any f efficiencies or water column drops currently, but there's no guarantee as to where we, underground aquifers, it's hard to predict is what, how they're gonna react as surface water starts diminishing. And so we don't know how, what kind of Im implications that'll have on, on the underground aquifers that, and ultimately the wells that are drawing from there. Okay. So. So when you mentioned uh, shutting down the plant mm -hmm. around October on a normal year, when that happens, then after that, our drinking water comes from the wells? The wells, yeah. Directly? For, yeah, well, the wells uh, as well as um, our Weaver Basin allotment. Gotcha. That they've got some treatment that okay. they, they give us on the south end of the okay. state. Okay. Yes. So because it's, it's a little bit of an, an unpredictable situation, then it's going to, I guess, 
be assessed constantly to see what happens and then yep. make decisions down the road. Yep, and okay. we'll we'll kind of get into this with some of the phases okay. and what we're watching in a little bit. Thank you. So, I apologize, okay. I interrupted. No, you're good. Um, so as you can kind of see, this is the water availability index for Ogden and Weaver. On the right-hand side is kind of where you want to see. So for the Ogden, we're about the fifth percentile, which is one of the, we're bottom of the range in a sense, um, comparatively to the years in the past. So as well as um, the Weaver. And so if you see in the blue, that's the storage, and then the green is the stream flow. Okay. So um, the water shortage management plan. So with this, what, why we elevated into a phase two moderate is based on this surface water supply index that we just, or data that we just went through, um, along with looking at the reservoir, monitoring our wells, we look and see that there's, we're falling below a 30% normal. Um, and so that triggers us into phase two on a moderate shortage. So our target with that is a 5% reduction as a city as a whole, meaning everybody, not just us, right? So that's the whole city. Um, with that, we're, we're enforcing um, some water restrictions when it becomes from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., um, as well as we're encouraging resident, residential to cut back 5% and then commercial to cut back 15%. Um, so, yeah, there won't, we'll get into some more of this later on too with some of the things we're doing on as a city. Um, so phase three, so this is the next phase we're looking at. So right now we're looking at those, those reservoirs, we're looking at those wells to see as our, our potential water column drops. If and when we drop below a 50% of normal of our water supplies, this will trigger phase three, which is gonna be a, a severe <laughs> phase. Um, and at that point we'll be looking to do a 15% reduction. And then this is phase four, which is the extreme shortage. Um, so I'm not gonna go really into depth on that one, but I would anticipate phase three, we would probably be going into that maybe about July-ish or mid-July, depending on how everything shakes out and where we're at with our supplies. So, um, and then as of the first week in June, we did put out a declaration um, that was a lot going into the moderate sh shortage um, phase two. So this is, the the declaration that was sent out and it's got the bullet points as to mandatory versus voluntary and what we're requiring in that declaration as well as you can see off to the right hand side that's the press release that would have went out with that declaration reiterating all of that so um, this is the letter that was going out in conjunction with that um, declaration to there again encourage people to conserve and save um, there's a lot of good information when it comes to our web portal. We've actually set up um, some key points on the main homepage to where if people see water, water wasters or anything that we can help, help people um, re reduce their, their, their water. And also we've got a phone number up there for our conservationists also. So that's going out to residents. And then some of the things that the city's currently doing, obviously we're not watering between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If and when there are potentials of stuck, st stuck valves or anything, please feel free to make us aware of it so that we can get on that to try and make an effort to conserve even better. Um, it's common to have sometimes infrastructure fails that way. So um, we're also cutting back. We're working with the parks and cemetery and, and golf courses to um, make an effort to cut back on our conservation or on in an effort to conserve on our water. Um, we won't be running any fountains this year. Um, and then we're also, as you guys are very much aware, we're trying to replace old antiquated um, water lines, especially downtown, um, to try and keep the water in the pipes. So there's some other bullet points that you can go through. We There again, Matt, who's our water conservationist, he's been going out um, and meeting with residents on consultations if he observes um, irregular um, consumption going on as well as there's some web pages that we're asking people to visit. Um, with that, one of the things that I'd like to point you to is the bullet point 12, encouraging fire restrictions. Um, I know Chief Matthews will probably be speaking to you here shortly um, with some of that. Um, but to, to kind of put this into perspective, so about a year ago, if you recall, there was a fire at the mouth of the canyon. So with that fire, um, we on that typical day, we would have been producing about 20 million gallons for the city as a whole. Um, that we project, well, we estimate that 
it probably took about four and a half to five million gallons to put that fire out and fight it. So that was one fourth of what the city would have utilized on one given fire. And so that's why it's so important when it comes to fire restrictions and encouraging that. So um, also here's some, some uh, rebates that can be utilized. If you go to Utah Water Savers, there's some potential toilet rebates that you can take advantage of as well as smart controllers, as well as Matt has some conservation kits that for soil moisture meters and other things that are included in there. So we would recommend people talk to him with some of that. Um, and then, as you can kind of see too, there's, this is another great resource when it comes to watering weekly. So if you go to conservewater.utah.gov, they have a weekly guide on doing watering. So right now, at the state level, they're asking that Northern Utah survive, make a goal to survive, not thrive in a sense when it comes to watering. So they're asking to water twice a week is what they're asking. And so there's a lot of great tips and, and guides that can be um, seen and, and learned from if you go to that webpage. Um, and then just to, to kind of help decipher between turf, whether it's dead or um, dormant, um, I think it's as a quick check, usually you can go up and grab a, a section of grass and give it a tug to see whether or not it's got root resistance um, on the root crown. That's usually a good indication that the root is still intact intact and that it's in dormancy in a sense. If and when you're able to pull a chunk of it out and you can see the roots are shriveled, that's usually a good indication that they're um, inactive and aren't working. And so that's usually showing that your grass is dying also. Another good indicator is if and when the blade, blade of the grass starts to curl, that's showing that the, the blade or well, the grass is in stress. And so you should start checking the root crown to see if and when you need to do some spot watering or whatnot to just try and keep it into dormancy. Um, on average, you're probably gonna be looking at like maybe one inch a week to try and keep a, a healthy dormancy type turf. Oh, I, I slaughtered that. So to try and keep your turf in a good healthy dormant state, it would be that you would probably apply about one inch a week. So a pop-up head sprinkler is probably gonna apply half an inch for 15 to 20 minutes. A, a, rot a rotor or directional is gonna be a half inch for about 30 to 40 minutes. So hopefully that gives you some data and then there's some other information you can kind of go through on some of that. There's some pictures off to the side kind of trying to give some examples of what that is. And then with us um, dealing with the, ten the watering from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., we are going out and enforcing this. So we will be, these are the door hangers that'll be associated with that. We're working with code enforcement as well. Um, so that we'll hang these on doors, making sure that people are aware that they're in violation of that in a sense. Um, we'll be giving them a first kind of warning state and, and dropping these out there. And then obviously the second door hanger that they receive at that point, they'll, they'll receive um, whatever's in, well, the penalty that's, there's, there's some fines that are associated in our ordinance that will go along with some of that. So, and we're currently in the tier one, which I think it's 50, 100, and 150 is, is kind of, the, the first offense is a 50, second offense is 100, and then the third offense would be 150. And that's just for this moderate state currently. So um, that's kind of what the door hanger will look like, just so you guys are aware. And then thank you for conserving water and making every drop count, so. Thank you. I have a quick question, mm -hmm. Chair. Uh, so <clears throat> how are we, I think I saw a newsletter, but how, how are we planning on getting the word out into our community to, to let them know about these? So yeah, I, I, I would encourage people to go to our web portal for sure, because that's gonna be posted on our conservation webpage, as well as we are sending that out through direct mail to all residents throughout the city is how that word is going out. Direct so, mail? Correct, yep. And, and then we're- and, and social media. Yep. We'll be hitting all our social media sites as much as possible to alert people and direct them to where they can find information. Yep. Social we've, media, okay. We've been working with Mike Bubride and he's been great to help us with some of that. Mm. Thank you, I, Mark. I would, uh, I would encourage us, the council and the mayor uh, to do some sort of campaign because uh, I think these these calls to that level of of uh, urgency and 
and level of engagement from us directly to talking uh, to our residents to stress how important this is. So I don't know if at any time we can talk about that. I don't know if the mayor is already planning on doing anything, uh, Mark. But uh, I would just love to put that out there, Chair, for your consideration. Okay. Very good. Chair, can I make a comment, yes, please? <clears throat> I was actually wondering if uh, if it'd be helpful. Maybe it's just adds to an existing chorus, but we considered a resolution urging the governor to uh, ban fireworks for the drought. I know it's not within our power to do it. We don't have the authority to do it, but we can pass a resolution urging the governor to do it. Just another idea. Okay. <laughs> Councilmember Nandowski, I'm not sure the governor has the power. I think it might have to be the legislature that does it. I thought he banned it on state property, but I don't know that he has oh, the I ability to ban it yeah, at other property. places. Oh, okay. So it might, it might need to be the legislature that we're talking to. Okay. Thanks. So could we find out about these? That's something that who, who could help us find out? We can look into it, but yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I believe it's the, the legislature because yeah. I know he did ban it on public properties. Okay. I have a question. I, on, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have. I have another quick question. So we're 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 talking to residents, but what we've got a lot of industry and commercial uses that use a lot of water. What are we doing for those industries and? In so we yeah we're trying to monitor some of the counts that we have in our software and also starting to have conversations with some of those individuals. Um, because if I remember right, that's a not a significant, but a fairly is. significant portion of our water users. Yep. Yeah, and it is. And and we can do a better job moving into the future on some of it too. So we we can try and target it through some of the social media as well as reaching out some of the, to some of the higher consumers and, and see if, what we can do to try and help them along through that. So. I saw a letter today that BDO sent all of the tenants that are out of BDO warning them that they were not going to be watering as much and what the lawns were going to look like. And it was part of the water conservation. It was a great letter. I was happy to see how proactive Boyer was being with out of BDO. <clears throat> Question. Um, so I noticed on the uh, door hanger that there was a check mark for where residents have reported somebody else. I and mean, I guess I just wonder what's the capacity for the city to take calls around people getting reported. I mean, I'd be happy to volunteer to go around and put them on people's <laughs> doors if you're yeah, so. taking volunteers because it's. I think you're just going to get inundated with so many calls. It can be overwhelming. Yeah. So currently, um, our utility billing has been able to. Our front office has been able to more or less take all those calls right now, and we're trying to channel them through some designated personnel to try and keep them a closer eye on them. So if and when there are repeat offenders, that we're right. working with code enforcement on that. But right now, we're channeling most of that's coming through our front office and utility billing, and then funneling down to the conservationists mm -hmm. in a sense. So that's, and then obviously is our. I shouldn't say obviously, um, as our crews are out throughout the city and observe violations, we've also had staff meetings where we've discussed they also need to be encouraging and putting door hangers out there as they're making their rounds and amongst their other duties in mm -hmm. a sense. So, I, I have a question on the, that type of a situation. Uh, do we first warn them about the situation and encourage them to follow the guidelines that are listed on that door hanger it, that we present to them. And then the next one would be the actually violation that yeah, would take it, place. In a sense, most of them that have been coming through, we've, we've got to have substantial justification showing. If, if and when there was a picture that showed the address, the, them in violation, and it was date stamped more or less, that's kind of the information we're going after. Um, if and when we, there's a referral that comes through, we go out and meet, meet with those people or leave a door hanger to let them know, hey, like somebody's either reported you or one of our staff observed it. And so that kind of is the warning in a sense. And then from there, it will evolve. Um, and obviously, we, we are, are trying to get picture and substantial evidence to make that creditable so that it actually 
can stand up um, if and when there are fines. Um, so, so council member, we're looking for compliance, not necessarily income and revenue. Okay. Our goal is to get people just to comply, right. and uh, and I think we would find them just to get their attention if we can't by nicely asking them to to be compliant. Yeah, I would think that uh, first talking to him and educating them would be the first process going through. Yep. Yep. That That's our goal. Okay. Thank you, Brady. Thank you. Very good information. Thank you. Okay. Okay, it looks can I ask like one more question, yes, though? Yes, please. Um, did we look at the ordinance? It, as we move through the phases, does the mayor have to sign the declaration? I, I noticed... I'm just curious who's the next. So yeah, the, on phase three, it would still come through the utility manager and I would work with administration and the council in, in issuing the like the declaration into phase three. It's not until phase four, once it is a, it's an extreme drought or extreme water shortage scenario that the mayor really um, puts out kind of like a declaration, but ultimately we still work closely with Mark Johnson and, and, and the mayor and all that, so. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. No worries. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's go back up and do the uh, Juneteenth Freedom Day joint proclamation declaring June 19th, 2021, Juneteenth Freedom Day in Ogden City. And we have Councilmember Lopez who volunteered to read that. Uh, thank you, Chair. It is an honor to uh, read this uh, proclamation um, and Thanks to Betty for being here. Uh, <clears throat> so declaring June 19, 2021, Juneteenth uh, Freedom Day in Ogden City. Whereas Juneteenth is the oldest known celebration commemorating the abolition of slavery in the United States and the emancipation of African-American slaves throughout the Confederate South, Union soldiers landed at Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865 with the news that the war had ended and that enslaved uh, were now free. More than two years after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued on January 1, 1863. Until that day, slavery had been relatively unaffected in Texas by the Emancipation Procl Proclamation. And Texas had been viewed as a safe haven for slave owners to relocate with their slaves because the state, ex the state experienced no large scale fighting or significant presence of Union troops. And whereas, whereas on the first Juneteenth, a name that combines June and 19th, the people of Texas were Red General Order Number 3, which stated the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. And the connection here, here, um, heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and free laborer. The Juneteenth announcement was met uh, with a jubilation that spread throughout the country as African Americans relocated to neighboring states and became reacquainted with family. And whereas the first Juneteenth celebration was a time for reassurance, prayer, and gathering of family members. Juneteenth continued to be widely observed in Texas decades later, with many former slaves and descendants making an annual pilgrimage back to Galveston. Juneteenth today continues to grow within communities and organizations throughout the country. Numerous local and national Juneteenth organiza organizations have a, a arisen alongside older organizations with the common mission of promoting and cultivating knowledge and appreciation of Afri African American history and culture. While encouraging continuous self-development and respect for all people and culture, cultures, and whereas during the 2016 legislative session, Utah became the 45th state in the nation to have an official state observance of Juneteenth Freedom Day, which is commemorated annually in Utah on the third Saturday in June. The Juneteenth commemoration has been observed in Utah as a community freedom festival for more than 75 years by various communities. This year's Utah Juneteenth Freedom and Heritage Festival will be held both virtually and in person June 19 at 12 p.m. Uh, through June 20 at 8 p.m. at the Ogden Amphitheater. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Ogden City Council and Mayor Michael P. Caldwell 
hereby, hereby proclaim June 19, 2021 as Juneteenth Freedom Day in Ogden City. We encourage residents, schools, businesses, and community groups to celebrate Juneteenth as a day of remembrance and celebration. We appreciate the significant efforts of those in our community and state representatives that make this special holiday an official observance. Pass and adopted this 15th day of June 2021. And uh, do I need to make a motion? Mm -hmm. Make a motion to adopt this proclamation, Chair. Second. I second it. <laughs> we have a motion by Councilmember Lopez and a second by pretty much everyone. Okay. Um, we'll give it to Councilmember Stevens uh, to adopt this joint proclamation declaring June 19th, 2021 as Juneteenth Freedom Day in Ogden City. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes. So should we invite Betty, Miss Betty, to come up invite some of my and invite your friends to come with you, whoever you'd like to invite. And as I was reading this, uh, Chair, if I remember correctly, Miss Betty was involved in that state legislation, For sure. uh, correct? So yes, sir, we would love to hear from you, Miss Betty, uh, after you take a picture with us, Thank uh, if it's so okay. Much. And Appreciate we're shaking hands now. We were all vaccinated here, <laughs> so no problem. We do a vaccination objective request. Send anybody that has it. Thank you so much. I'm going to grow a few inches here. Hey. 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 Oh, yeah, she will. Say, I'll make a quick statement. I Thanks for accommodating me. My Miss Juneteenth is still wandering around Ogden <laughs> trying to oh, no. figure out how to get in the building. But uh, on behalf of Project Success Coalition and our Utah Juneteenth Committee, we just thank you for your ongoing support. We thank you for uh, doing the work to promote equity and inclusion and justice throughout our community, throughout our public um policies and the work that you do each and every day. Uh, you did an excellent job in sharing that history. So, you know, a lot of people only know that it was that day, but you've taken the time to include other information that helps us all understand the gravity of this kind of celebration and the importance of commemorating it on an annual basis. So I hope to see some of you on Saturday or Sunday at the amphitheater, and I will make sure that you get to come on stage and greet the folk. <laughs> it's so important, they would love to see you all. And as we look at Juneteenth into the future, uh, it's something that we're hoping that we'll consider making a holiday, a day off uh, for our community and then having other events to make sure our families and friends get to commemorate this important time. Uh, freedom is not free, and we know just by some of the things that we see happening every day that we have to continually work to preserve those things that we've won over the, the many, many decades to make sure that we have um, the right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, being able to have housing that's affordable, <laughs> being able to have jobs that can help pay those bills, medical care, all of those things are a part of what we promote as we not only commemorate, but educate and get involved. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like I should just apologize in advance. I might as well that I will be out of town this weekend, Miss Betty. So I'm, I'm really very, very sorry. I won't be able to be there, but it, it won't cost you too much. <laughs> in spirit. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. On behalf of your Miss Juneteenth, I'm sure the roads getting in and out of here are a little difficult and tricky. So it should never be that hard to come here and get something, but it is today. So we apologize. But thanks so much for being here. Okay, catching back up. We have our second request to be on the agenda uh, for firework and open flame restrictions. And tonight we have Chief Matthew here. 
to go ahead and discuss that. Council Chair and fellow council members, thank you for a few minutes of your time. Uh, in relationship to what you just heard, I, I, the great interruption with this commemorative event, um, it, it's a, that's a tough act to follow, uh, but it was much easier had I followed Brady with the, the water drought issue as, as a relational item. But um, I already left. Uh, I wanted to thank her. That was great. Um, the conditions that we're under right now, um, we have to follow data in order to uh, get to a fire restriction. And I want to give you a little bit of background information because you've had some questions already come up about restrictions, bans, and so forth. And I'll explain that with uh, explanation of a couple of state statutes. But we use the National Interagency Fire Center out of Boise that does a predictive analysis on conditions, meaning the environmental conditions, relative humidity, the temperature, uh, the prediction of where we're going. We You'd almost have to be living under down in a deep cave in a hole really far down underground and not know what's going on. So what I'm going to explain to you is pretty much common sense, but I, I need to explain it to you because it's the data that drives where we've ended up to. And the conditions not only with the drought, but the relative humidity of all of that wildland fuel out there, all the vegetation, the extreme temperatures, the winds, we're under a, a red flag warning right now for fire danger along the Wasatch Front. And we're in that until tomorrow night because of the current conditions, the relative humidity, the high temperatures, and the winds. And those conditions are like and similar to what we normally see in the end of August. And it's June 15th. And so uh, what's in store for us, we, we don't know, but it doesn't look good right now for a fire danger, fire risk situation when it comes to wildland vegetation. So with that, let me give you a little bit of background information on why and how we can put in place fire restrictions, what we can and can't do, because I think you'll have some questions about that. First of all, one of the state statutes is a fireworks statute. They can be sold between June 24th and July 25th. They can be ignited between the 2nd of July and the 5th of July between the hours of 11 a.m. and 11 p.m. with the exception on the 4th, they can be lit until midnight. We get a lot of complaints about that, animals and the frustration with that. They can also be lit during the days of July 22nd through the 25th. And once again, on the 24th, they can go till midnight. If you are in violation of a fireworks violation, meaning that you either ignite them outside of the window of opportunity or ignite them in an area that's been restricted, you could uh, suffer the consequences of an infraction with a fine up to $1,000. With that state statute, a county or municipality or township may not prohibit fireworks except for certain areas with hazardous environmental conditions. Well, what does that mean? Then you refer to another state statute in regards to fire restrictions. And this is kind of explains the hazardous environmental conditions, and I'll just quote this portion of the statute. When a fire code official determines that existing or historical hazardous environmental conditions necessitate controlled use of an ignition source, including fireworks, lighters, matches, sky lanterns, and smoking materials, any of the following may occur. So that's one qualifier. Now here's the next qualifier. If historical conditions exist in and this defines the areas, mountainous brush covered, forest covered areas, dry grass areas within 200 feet of waterways, trails, canyons, washes, ravines, or similar areas, wildland interface area, meaning the line, the area, or zone where structures meet or intermingle with undeveloped wildland or limited area outside hazardous areas to readily identify a closed area. And, and so what that means is that um, they've kind of defined the areas in which within our municipality we could restrict fireworks and or fire within. So we can't restrict it totally. And a, a couple of words you should be aware, aware of. Um, I've got an email I have to respond to on behalf of the mayor received today that they've said if ever there was a time, now's the time, mayor, you should ban fireworks in Ogden City. We cannot by state statute ban all we can do is restrict. Those are two significant things. We can restrict in some areas, but not all. We can't restrict in urbanized areas where there's no natural vegetation at risk. Uh, what happened a few years ago legislatively is that some cities or municipalities or fire marshals or fire chiefs took liberty of an open-ended restriction and banned them completely in their cities. It upset the other side of the equation of people who want to celebrate July 4th, have their fireworks, and light them in areas that are not hazardous or dangerous and they weren't allowed to. So the legislature felt it was necessary to come in and put these barriers up of what you can and can't do in terms of restrictions and you can't have a total ban. Uh, 
So that's what we're what we're up against right now. So when we create a restriction, they give us guidelines on how to create them, natural barriers or significant roadways in which we can define the area. Instead of trying to go up along the east bench and stay one and a half blocks below the wildland interface and a jagged line, which would be very hard to explain to anybody or enforce, we've come up with for a number of years now east of Harrison Boulevard for reasons of easy enforcement and to easily identify and educate the public about where these locations are. Uh, we, we have the obligation to produce a map. We have an obligation to identify practically what the hazard area is. And we have to look at our historical hazardous conditions, at least identifying these hazardous conditions two of the previous five years. We have an obligation to produce a map by May 1st, which our map traditionally doesn't change much because the risk is traditionally the same. And thank you, Brandon, for that cue of putting the map up. And that's our map that's on the website. Uh, most notably, east of Harrison Boulevard, on the if you're looking to the north, on the right side of the screen for the audience, and then down along the parkway, down through the parkway into the uh, landfill area in Fort Buena Ventura. Uh, those are all restricted areas that we've identified because of the amount of vegetation in and around close to the rivers and the risk and the parkway. So those are the two guiding statutes we have to follow as a municipality in order to restrict, not ban, open flame or fireworks. So our city ordinance defines uh, the areas of potential environmental hazardous conditions as per state requirements, which is present here, mountainous brush, covered forest, wildland, urban, you know, and we can prohibit ignition source in those areas. When the fire marshal determines the hazardous environment conditions exist in the described areas. So we have to look at the data supporting the conditions to warrant the restrictions in order to do this. And one thing that I'm relatively proud of in terms of balancing the use of our authority is this is the earliest I've ever seen in, in in my history that we have restricted this soon, which we issued these restrictions as of June 2nd. If you remember three or four years ago, we did issue restrictions after the 4th, but not until after the 4th. We only issued them for the 24th. So we balanced using the science of the environmental conditions as to when to initiate the restriction, because that's what state statute would prefer us to do, and I think it's a reasonable approach. Um, the conditions we have now are pretty obvious. They're probably one of the worst I've seen, I don't know, in my time as the fire chief. So in regards to issuing those restrictions, we define the hazardous environmental condition area. We issue a notice of location and the length of the time the conditions expect to exist, which we are saying from June 2nd to right now, we're predicting September 20th. We don't see any relief in sight. We provide the map of the restricted area. We file it with a city recorder and we, uh, city recorder and we publish it within the newspaper and we file a copy of the notice and the exhibits to the city council for your information and for public distribution. Uh, as a couple of companion items that have occurred, and you've probably read about, and I think you talked about them briefly earlier, the state forester who works for the, um, the state natural resources division of, of forestry, fire, and state lands has issued two orders. One order of the state forester is issued as of July, June 9th. Fireworks are prohibited in all unincorporated areas of state lands and all state lands. So that's their, their breadth of influence and authority. Um, they've also issued a stage one fire restrictions due to these environmental conditions, low humidity, high temperatures, winds, that no open flames except in improved campgrounds and or permanent fire pits. No smoking except in vehicle or on paved or area free of vegetation. Um, additionally, no cutting, welding, grinding of any metal or operating motorcycle, chainsaw, ATV, or other engines without spark arresters. This is for all areas of the state lands and unincorporated areas. So they've issued those two restrictions. We've issued our restriction locally for Ogden City Municipality. Um, we, at this point, um, as much as with the conditions, uh, we can have a lot of discussion about fireworks, but at this point, the state statute restricts our ability from doing more than just restricting in these environmentally hazardous condition areas. And so that's what we're up against. That's what I wanted to bring to your attention. The map is what's going to be out there. We are working with Mike McBride to get the information out, working with Public Works to one of the things that's been highly effective in terms of just getting people's attention is if you notice the traffic message boards that you don't see out very often unless you have some construction or a road close, Public Works is dedicating a couple of those along Harrison Boulevard for us to let them know that no fireworks east of Harrison Boulevard, and we'll start putting those out and getting those lit up. 
um, and and hopefully just get the message out that uh, if it's not already known right now that we're under extreme fire conditions currently, I can tell you we're battling a fire down along Parker Drive and the railroad uh, property since Sunday. We were back down there again today. Uh, Public Works is helping us with some backhoes down there because we're just having such a tough time getting some of the fire out that's in the, the subgrade. And uh, it's jumping. The cotton is moving. We're spot firing everywhere. We, they were on Sunday. They were battling fires, and they turn around and see fires starting behind them, twenty feet away, thirty feet away. It's it, the conditions are just not good. Chief, may may I add just two things? Number one, the average house fire, we spend about a million gallons of water to put it out. We approximate on the. The, the 4th of July weekend and the 24th of July weekend, the fire department goes from fire to fire to fire to fire. Most of them have been started by fireworks. We are really concerned about this year with the lack of water and the amount of fires that we, we normally have. We will be sending police officers with fire to drive around the neighborhoods looking for people who are violating um, the, these restricted areas, and we will be finding them. We have to. We've we got to send a message out that we have to take this seriously this year. We don't have the wire, water to put out very many fires. We can't have the fires. And so we're going to go as far as we can go enforcement-wise to encourage people to be responsible during the holidays. And we'll be calling back personnel to staff some of our non-staff units, like our brush trucks, our little Can-Am defenders that are little wild land units, and we're going to patrol our fire prevention staff. We're just going to patrol the east bench, well, predominantly probably on the 3rd, because the 3rd will be on Saturday, 4th will be on Sunday. We don't know how many people and when they'll light the majority of their fireworks off, 3rd, 4th, or whether it'll occur on the 5th, which will be the, the designated holiday on Monday. So it's a little unique year this year. Chief, I have a question. Yes. I'm, I'm assuming you can answer this. I had some uh, residents call me. They're having like a neighborhood party up. They're going to go clean up a campsite up near, like, let's say, Kazi, up near Kazi. And they're going to spend the night. Is, are campfires allowed up there? They were asking if they can have a campfire up there as long as it's contained. And I didn't know. In, the in approved campgrounds in approved fire pits. So you can't, like, go create your own, but in your, in your in approved campground with an approved fire pit that's present. Okay. But they, we'll see. That's that's not our jurisdictional authority. Yeah. But if yep. they may pull those as well, because the one fire that is down south of Moab, eleven thousand acres, yeah. started from an unattended campfire. Right. And okay. one of the other interesting statistics: uh, four hundred and around four hundred and thirty-one fires so far this year, and three hundred and ninety-four human caused. Only forty-five were natural caused. They, you know, we can prevent. Forest fires, it <laughs> yeah. happens every year. I, you know, we can say it over and over and over again, but we can. Yep. Uh, Chief, can you report on a couple of years ago, we had a fire up on the uh, by the mouth of the canyon. Uh, can you give some uh, history about that one? Yes, um, that was a deliberately set fire. We found an actual flare out in the light fuel brush area. Somebody just decided to want to do something not so nice. And... Um, uh, like Brady said earlier, the amount of water, four to five million gallons of water over a two day period that we used to try to contain that, uh, dangerously got close to some of those houses up on the, um, north side of the Ogden Canyon area. We lost a portion of a fence up there, if I remember right. But, um, we protected the homes. Fortunately, didn't lose any of the homes, but, um, yeah, tremendous amount of water loss. And then you worry about, um, the, uh, stormwater protection or runoff protection and, and sloughing and sliding in that area. Fortunately, we didn't have any of that, but you're, you worry about that with all the vegetation that's lost in the area. That took about, what, three or four days to put that out? Probably a week to get it completely out, but to get the smoke, the nuisance of the smoke to stop was probably three or four days. I just have one more question. Um, I was curious, do we have any alternates to water to you know, suppress fire in any way? We, we have foam that we can use in selective situations, which helps stretch the water and we can help suffocate some fires in some conditions. As a matter of fact, if you didn't hear, the transfer station caught on fire Saturday morning and that was burning rather significantly. There was smoke coming out all four corners of that. And um, eventually we got a heel filled truck in with foam. We didn't use our 
airport one because that's the only one we have, but through mutual aid. And it was actually the fire district fire. We were fire district just, just out of Oregon City, but we were there helping them. And we used foam to help get that under control. Still have to mix it with water, but. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chief, you mentioned something that I think <clears throat> you, you said it pretty quick, but it really bears repeating because I, I think we underestimate the after effect of fire. The, I mean, the fire is, is one thing. There's clear and direct risk, but that vegetation that is holding the soils in place, it takes a long time to grow and it takes quite a while to recover. And even recovery from like early seral species doesn't cut it. And so there's uh, those landslides and um, I mean, from the time that the fire's out to the time that that vegetation is reestablished, rain happens in between. And every time it rains, there is absolutely nothing holding it back. And the way mountains work, they collect the water and they send it right downhill. And that's right where we sit as a city. It's where I sit in my home and many other council members' homes do too. Mm -hmm. So um, this community is at risk Definitely. More, from more than just fire. That's yep. a continued and sustained risk after fire. Long-term recovery. It takes a while. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next up is the approval of minutes. Uh, first, we have the regular meeting of February 2nd, 2021. Councilmember Nadolski. They're good. Uh, and the joint session of March 9th, 2021. Councilmember Heyer. Yeah, I've reviewed them and they appear to be accurate. Thank you. The work session of February 2nd, 2021 and work session of February 9th, 2021. Councilmember Chaburka. They are correct. Thank you. The regular meeting of February 23rd, 2021 and joint session of March 16th, 2021. Councilmember Lopez. They are correct, Chair. And the joint session of March 2nd, 2021. Councilmember Stevens. Chair, they're correct, and I make a motion that we adopt the minutes that are being presented. Second. Thank you. We have a motion by Council Member Stevens to adopt um, the listed minutes and a second by Vice Chair White. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes. Uh, next up, we have one item listed under common consent, the fiscal year 2022 annual action plan. Um, and this is setting the public hearing for July 6, 2021. Motion to approve the common consent item. Second. Thank you. We have a motion by Councilmember Lopez to adopt the item list under common consent and set the public hearing for July 6, 2021, and the second by Vice Chair White. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes. Okay. Uh, next up is... The public hearing, fiscal year 2021 budget amendment, uh, the corner plaza, public art, and various other funding. And tonight we have Lisa Stout, comptroller here to present to us. Thank you. I'll try and do a better job and make that name longer next time. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to be here, Chair Blair, Vice Chair White, council members. Um, Christy McBride is also here to help present this uh, budget action. Um, the action before you is to appropriate an additional $1,110,785 to the city budget. Uh, many of these items will be used for year-end supplies. Um, we're proposing a use of fund balance in, um, let's see, let me, let me go to the next slide real quick. In the amount of five hundred and twenty-five thousand seventy-five dollars, um, <throat> this will appropriate money to the neighbor up grant uh, that will increase the grant budget to twenty thousand dollars, and then we have been carrying forward what's available in that account to uh, the next next fiscal year, so it's there until it's spent. Um, we're also um, asking to appropriate uh, eighty thousand in technical services and equipment in uh, le the legal department. They need to replace their current prosecutor software um, and the current estimate that they have for this replacement, the implementation, and then the first year of maintenance is $80,000. Um, 
Uh, we're also asking to appropriate 38000 for the public safety assessment and consulting services. This is the wellness program that public safety has implemented. This will pay for a, an additional year contract year, a year of service under this um, for, for that consulting service. Also, we're asking to increase the fire turnouts by $9,550. Uh, small tools and equipment by 5,000, uh, fire hoses by 10,000, prevention, books and subscriptions by 625, education by 800, um, and then the AED replacements for city build buildings. Those are the defibrillators by the, the um, elevator. Uh, for uh, $51,000. Um, they are ready to to spend this money once it's appropriated. They would like to have it done before year-end, um, have these, these things purchased before year-end. We're also asking council to appropriate an additional $228,000 in um, the ladder truck expenses. They uh, have been backfilling this with small tools and equipment, but they were short in that budget this year due to the new ladder truck they purchased. And then we're also asking to increase the engineering interns budget by $25,000 and then the forestry tools and equipment by $70,000. We're also asking to move a total of $127,100 from CED's budget over to uh, the CIP. A portion of this is from a ramp. Uh, just over 10000 is remaining from a ramp the city received in 2018 that was inadvertently budgeted in the general fund, should have been budgeted in the CIP fund. So we would like to move the remaining money and consolidate this all into the, the uh, CIP that... Uh, Arts and Events has right now for the corner art piece and the plaza. And um, and then we would like to recognize that transfer into the CIP fund to appropriate to um, the Arts Plaza and then also ap appropriate $30,000 out of the Public Arts Fund uh, for that same project, and um, I'll turn I, I'll turn the speaker the microphone over to Christy in just a minute. She can go into some more detail about what that thirty thousand will be used for. Um, we'd also like to unappropriate a total of two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars to use for the the zoning ordinance update. Uh, so this is a large project uh, planning is looking to do. It will last approximately two years. Um, we've asked for temporary funding in the fiscal year 22 budget for two um, planners to help with this, this program. Additionally, we're asking for this 150, this 250,000, um, well, 150 from other projects and then 100 from a refund they received uh, from the Blue Loan Program. Um, that program is no longer functioning and all the money the city put into that program has been refunded, which would give them $250,000 to go out to bid now so they can start looking for a vendor to help with, with that zoning ordinance update. Lisa, would you mind going back just to your previous slide, please, real quick? Was there one between these and the last one? This one. Okay, thank, thank you. Yes, absolutely. And then I will invite Christy out to talk about the bubble. Hi, Christy McBride, Ogden Arts, Culture, and Events Division Manager. Um, just to give you a quick background on this uh, project, we um, were approved for funding from you all, thank you, um, in 2019 for a public art um, project um, to upgrade the corner plaza and install a major public art piece there. Um, shortly after that, we did a public art call. We had 189 submissions, which is amazing. Um, it took us a long time to get through those, but we had some time on our hands in 2020, so we um, worked with the Arts Committee 
and narrowed that down to, I think, 10 or 12, and then narrowed that down to three. We did interviews, and uh, the Huda Sosa group is a husband and wife team out of New York. They were selected um, to start working with the design team here locally to com come up with a concept design that would be Art and Plaza as one. So it was really important to us to not just um, upgrade the plaza and then plunk a piece of art down that didn't feel like it all was a cohesive design. So they've been working together throughout the year to come up with um, plaza and art piece designs to uh, live together as one. And through that, um, we came close to 50% construction drawings and um, had selected the piece seen here called Bubble. Um, and in that, we recognized that the lighting in that area and what was planned in the plaza was not really sufficient enough to give the art the the uh, lighting that it deserved. And so we brought that to the Arts Committee, and they were also in support. So the design team and the Arts Committee do agree that additional lighting for this piece is important. Um, so that's where that additional 30000 is needed, and also to kind of help with some of the increased construction costs that we're all aware of. So I think that's about it. And then they just they had a picture of what it, the sculpture would look like with and without the lighting. Um, <clears throat> Finally, we, we just have some um, miscellaneous items that we would like to appropriate for year end um, to recognize, uh, first of all, some uh, a, a, ref, uh, a payment that El Monte received. Uh, it's a, a negotiation they have with their software vendor. Um, as they fill up tea times, they can get a rebate for more the more tea times um, that are used and that was about 14,000 this year additionally they've had some donations for the El Monte Clubhouse um, so that total appropriation would be 16,000 that would help replace the flooring in the El Monte um, Clubhouse um, as you know that facility is getting quite old and and just needs regular maintenance and then we've also received a couple of easy ramp grants that we would like to get into the year-end budget. One for the Union Station for some signage in the um, in the museum, and then um, in the Golden Hours, they're putting together a wildcat room um, <clears throat> with seating and, and a large screen TV and and some other some other uh, items for that room. Um, both of those cost a little more than the 2000 easy ramp grant. Uh, however, their operating budget is paying the difference between what they need for the project and what the easy ramp grant was awarded for. And then we have um, some donations related to Union Station, um, a total of just over $200,000, 10000 from UTA, and then the Union Station Foundation has uh, awarded the city 199000 Both of these will go towards the campus design for the Union Station area. Um, and then we've received another HIDA grant for the strike force. Uh, we'd like to appropriate that, appropriate that for year end. Um, that would be carried forward into fiscal year 22 as well. The total appropriation would be $1,110,000. One million one hundred and ten thousand seven hundred and eighty-five dollars, and the request tonight is that you adopt Ordinance twenty twenty-one twenty-seven to appropriate this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, seeing no questions for Christy or Lisa, we'll go ahead and. Um, have Brandon explain, well, I don't know if we need to anymore. We have people here for the public. This is a public hearing, so we can accept public, in public input on this item. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how. Are there any participants? Are there anybody particip participating via you Zoom? Not no. No. We do have one. Um, sorry, let me get that fixed for you.
better. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this is a public hearing, so we'll go ahead. Um, it looks like we have Moto G with their hand raised. So if we could just have you state your name and address for the record, and then you're welcome to speak on this issue. Apologies, I was um, just going to make a general public comment, not something on this, so I'll do that later. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Go ahead. know what this is about. <laughs> um, he's Sato Ogden resident. Um, uh, for those of you that don't know me personally, I'm a sculptor that's worked primarily in the field of public art for uh, about 30 years. Um, I've designed and mostly fabricated sculptures from Alaska to Dubai, um, millions of dollars worth of work in the public realm. Um, plus the work I did for another artist prior to my own solo career. Um, this is all just to establish that this is my realm. <laughs> I, 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 um, this, this is what I care most about. Um, and I, I have some concerns that I hope can be remedied um, about this project um, for the corner, and I feel I'd be remiss in not bringing it up now. I brought it up before the Planning Commission, and they said it wasn't their purview. Um, uh, one thing um, I haven't resolved, the, the bubble-like design is different than the more faceted version I saw in the other um, maybe you can address that later, or um, the design's different, but the the problem's the same in both of them. Um, uh, with either design, there's there's a problem I wanted to lay out, and it's that I, I feel there's a serious legal liability with this design. Um, uh, Mark Stratford uh, said that I brought some valid concerns, and. I've, I've heard that the city is, in fact, considering these concerns, so I'm happy to hear that. Um, in my opinion, the corner artwork is what's known legal, legally as an attractive nuisance, um, in that its design creates a dangerous situation for the public. Uh, the first concern for a city's art in public spaces should be safety. Um, the design, by definition, is is very climbable. Um, it's on top of a hard concrete surface. Um, it has openings between the parts of the artwork that allow, like, an arm to, as climbing, slip through and get caught. There's a reason, like, gyms have um, big openings and they're over soft surfaces, so kids can just slide through rather than getting stuck and break bones. Um, and so. Um, basically, I'm worried that, one, someone could end up with a really bad injury. That's my first concern. I, I, I want to see something happen with this design that we're assured that will prevent that from being able to happen. Um, I don't want that for the city, and I, I certainly don't want it for the, these artists because I know this is their, as far as I can find, this is their first permanent public artwork that they've created, and that would be a terrible start. Um, two, I don't want the city to end up being sued for a significant amount of money for such an accident, and I want to be sure we don't spend $130,000 on a work of art that will have to be removed and destroyed shortly after it's installed. installed. I, seen it happen before. Fortunately, not with my own work, but it does happen. Um, if any of you want to contact me about this outside of this, um, I do have some maintenance concerns about it, but I'd need to learn more details about it before uh, discussing those. Um, just feel free to reach out to me. Thanks. Thank you. Evening, Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. It's so nice to literally see everyone. 
Um, I wanted to uh, thank you for all the work that you've put in um, on the budget, and I know that this is an amendment, and um, I want to talk about a specific line within this amendment and then hope that you carry that over to the main budget. Um, I am 100% fully supportive of and highly encourage you to uh, support the $250,000 going to planning for a zoning update. Uh, for most of you know that I served on the Planning Commission for uh, a little over two years, and I spent a lot of time talking to planners because of issues that came up during planning meetings, and so I learned a little bit about that. And I had a couple of sit-down meetings with Greg of, like, why do things take so long? Why is this, why is this happening? And it's because everybody's spread pretty thin. And um, updating the code is a is a arduous task. It takes it takes a lot and it takes a very specialized type of person to do that. And in 2018, I stood right here and I suggested uh, after prying a number out of Greg that y'all gave planning 500,000 to contract the work to get it up to code as quickly as possible with the newest and best practices and to uh, find some money to hire two additional planners. Um, so I, as, as you know, with the Make Ogden plan, I mean, code sets the tone for what's happening 10 years, 15 years from now. It's a big thing, and, and it's not properly funded right now. Um, in 2018, you lost a lead planner for $12,000 and maternity leave. He now works in... Uh, Salt Lake City, and he is a director of a department, very, very valuable employee, and that's because of the salary and maternity leave. And as Council Member Nadolski pointed out, it's not always salary, it's culture, or, um, you know, now we all know that we can work remotely, and this other planner, uh, one of the reasons he went to Salt Lake City is they allowed him to work remotely two days a week because he had a new baby. Um, until the baby was grown. So you need to consider that. And, and there's also a, a challenge in the current planning department, which you might be able to look at and make some modifications uh, and put some money behind it to help them figure it out. In the planning department, there is no, no clear career path. There is a junior planner and a senior planner. Salt Lake City has planner one, planner two, planner three, senior planners, and then peep directors over that. Right here, we we have we don't have that. There's no increase of responsibility. There's no increase of salary with those titles. Um, so so that's that's a problem if you want to be a planner and you want to expand your career. The police department and the fire department is a brilliant job. They have a grid with who you are and what you do and what your title is, and this is how you pass up through that with additional responsibility and money. So please give the planning department more money when you look at the regular budget, and I wholeheartedly support you giving them 250 thousand please give them more okay I don't see any more hands raised or movement I would entertain a motion sure, I'll make a motion that we close the public hearing second Thank you. We have a motion by Councilmember Hirons to close the public hearing and a second by Councilmember Traberka. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes. Uh, any further comment or discussion? Should we answer some of the inquiries? Please. Well, I think Heath brought up some questions. I don't know if if uh, if we need to address those at this particular time. Uh, I'm about the structure. About okay. um, I'm a fish biologist, so I <laughs> I noticed <laughs> <laughs> I noticed it too, but I thought about it in a different way. I was like, "Ooh, that my kids are really going to enjoy that." And that's <laughs> and then when he says comments, it's like, "Oh, that's the problem." So, yeah. <laughs> please, Christy, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to note that we have gone through a very extensive process in working with this um, artist, engineers, and designers. So there has been a lot of thought and conversation around that. Uh, the public hearing was about funding, and so I didn't come prepared with tons and tons of information about all of the work that's gone on behind it, but we have worked closely with a very professional team to put this project together, so there should not be any concerns. Okay. Mm. 
So what, what about hearing from legal? I think he also mentioned something about legal. Is that, would they have more information about these or not necessarily? Oh, is legal not here? <laughs> we have a recovery. Gary attorney. is um, on the Zoom. Gary, are you there? Mr. Williams, I should say. We don't know who's here. There's people in the sky, and we don't know where, who or where they are. <laughs> So perhaps I can, you know, make an effort. So the, the council's role is to fund or not fund. Mm -hmm. So it's the mayor's uh, decision to pick the art piece, and it's your role to fund or not fund it. So. Um, but are we allowed to ask these questions? You can ask the questions, sure. So is that what we're doing? And if nobody wants to answer, that's fine too. But they can say, we already have one that didn't have the information, and if. There's two that doesn't have it. That's fine too. But I just like to ask. I th I think the um, I'm not legal, but I think um, it's similar to some playgrounds that we have around the city. Um, but the the concerns were raised. Other you know, they're ones that we should take a look at. Um, I texted. Mara and suggested that the risk committee maybe take a look at it and maybe involve our engineering department just to do a double check, and we're willing to do that. Um, I also understand that this artist has done other um, art pieces around the country. I don't know how many, but I'm, I, th I don't know that this is his first one or their first one. I don't know that it's a him. I should say their. So, I mean, we're willing to go take a look at, have the risk committee look at it and take a look at the risk and have our engineering department do a double check. So if an injury happens uh, on that facility, uh, what happens? What's the process? How, how's that handled? Well, if they, the if they make a claim, it goes to the risk department and they, an, they analyze the claim. Okay. And from there, it processes whether... Um, the people pursue us legally, or, and and then um, we have Irma, which is our insurer uh, company, and they do an assessment to see if it's a valid claim, and then we go from there. Is it meant to be climbed on? I guess public art, in my feeling, it's not, not meant to be climbed on, no. but I think um, my kids would probably try. Oh, yeah, no, that's Not it. now, but when they were younger. I would try now. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm very immature, so. And Was so that a statement if, or a question? So if the risk uh, management <laughs> takes a look at the facility, they're going to take a look at the safety of it also on that, Mark? Yeah, we, we will. Okay. I mean, I I appreciated the concern, and we'll be happy to double check and make sure. I mean, always measure twice, cut once. Mm -hmm. I guess I get. You know, I'm just wondering in general. For I mean, if it's on city property, and it's not intended to be climbed on, I don't know. I just wonder what other you know things we have that people could do that could they maybe climb on the chairs at the amphitheater. I mean. Yeah, I mean, we have trip hazards probably everywhere, and we try and minimize them. This doesn't have grass underneath it, and so it would probably indicate to most people this isn't intended to be a, a, ple a piece of playground equipment. It doesn't mean that they won't, but, it, I mean, and so, yeah, we'll take a look at it. I, I think, it, like I said, I think it was a valid concern that we'll take a look at. So what's the total of this project? Um, I, I'm trying to figure out, 116.8, or is it just the 30,000 that we're looking at right now? We've already funded. $226,800, is that correct? So the additional request is the 127.1 plus the 30,000 in public art money. Um, I don't remember the total number of what the total project is off the top of my head. I'll have to go back um, to my office and, and get that information. But it was over 200000 for sure. 
estimated to cost two hundred twenty-six thousand eight hundred dollars. Is I'm just reading. That's it. that's exactly going forward, not including what has already been already invested, been. and and that's what I'm not sure of. What's already been spent? That's to finish the project, the two twenty-six. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would I would uh, be okay to make a motion for whatever the one million one hundred thousand seven eighty five minus whatever the number is to put that on hold or in some pot until we have the better answers. I don't know what that number is, though. I'm I'm trying to understand that. So. Is that a motion? No, I'm just trying to understand what that. Oh, so Lisa, is that one fifty seven <clears throat> one then the the one twenty seven one plus the thirty thousand? Yes. So that's one hundred fifty seven thousand one hundred. You want me to do the math tonight? So you have to double the one twenty seven one because oh, okay. it's a transfer out and then a transfer in. But we could still transfer it, set it aside in the CIP fund so it's sitting there, and when you're ready to appropriate it, when you're comfortable, we could do that. I do not have a substitute ordinance on me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So the clarification, Lisa, is that we would appropriate the funds and then that would be just set aside, is that right? Yes, the, so if we did it that way, the only change to the Schedule A and B would be we wouldn't appropriate it to a project. We would just put it in for future appropriation into the CIP fund. So it wouldn't change the ordinance total. It would change the Schedule B, the expenditure side. And we would still need to come back to you to have it appropriated from that fund. Correct. I'm comfortable with that. Does that sound? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that um, Council Member White, I mean, Vice Chair White, just because, um, I mean, I understand this is a funding conversation, but if we know that there's some liability that we, and I have faith that we would have dealt with it, but I'm, I agree. So would that delay the work on it then? Yes, because we would not have enough money to complete it. But we'll hurry with looking at it and get back to you as quick as we can. When was the schedule? When did we want to have it finished by or hopefully finished by? I don't know the answer, but soon. Please. Yeah, just come to the mic. We did an RFQ recently for a contractor to be under contract to do the plaza work and work with the artist to install it. Um, that RFQ closed a couple weeks ago and we reviewed them and a contractor has been identified, but they haven't been given their award letter. So there is a contractor identified that will be doing the work, um, but they won't be able to start until spring because of the current state of construction. So we do have plenty of time to work okay. through your questions, get you some answers, and still just have that funding um, wrapped up and ready when we're ready to go. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Sounds like it's your motion. I guess so. Yeah. Come up with something. Good luck. Huh? There. I propose that we um, adopt proposed ordinance 2021-27, um, amending the budget for fiscal year 2021. Uh, in the amount uh, listed, the 1,107,000, one, yeah, 10,785, um, allocating the money that's for the bubble um, to be set aside until we have further information regarding um, the liabilities, risks, and those kind of things. Second. Thank you. I'm not going to say it all again. These aren't going to help me. Um, <laughs> we have a motion <laughs> by Vice Chair White, and I'm going to try and do the best I can to repeat what she said. Uh, to adopt proposed ordinance 2021-27 for the 
amount of one million one hundred ten thousand seven hundred eighty-five dollars. Um, but appropriating money or setting money aside until that that research has been done, um, and then having that come back to the council to reappropriate those funds. In Schedule B. In Schedule B. Is that correct? <laughs> and a second by Council Member Chaburka. This is a roll call vote. Council Member Lopez? Aye. Council Member Nadolski? Aye. Council Member Stevens? Aye. Council Member Chaburka? Aye. Council Member Heyer? Aye. Vice Chair White? Aye. Chair Blair? I uh, thank you to everyone that passes. Um, next up is public comments. Was there any other discussion on that before we move on to public comments? It's just nice that I'm not the only troublemaker tonight. So thank you. Uh, public comments on what was that? Sorry. No, I was just if, any other comments on the budget amendment before we move on. No, that's good. Gotcha. Okay. Next up is public comments. This is an opportunity to address the council regarding concerns or ideas on any topic. Uh, please state your name and address for the record and limit your comments to three minutes. Yes. Great. My name is Priscilla Martinez. I'm a candidate for Ogden City Council District 3. I do have a question in regards to the water shortage. Um, do we know if there is already a communication plan in place? If in an extreme case we need to shut down the water plant, um, and then advising or proposing that we do use the stakeholders in our community, such as our church leaders or nonprofit organizations, to disseminate that information. And I know that we can also do it possibly right now as we are going through the phases. So that's kind of what I'm proposing. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. We do have a hand raised over or electronically. Um, again, all I can see is Moto G. So go ahead, Moto. The time is now yours. That is the name of my telephone. My name is Bonnie Christiansen, and I'm an Ogden resident here at uh, 2426 Fillmore Avenue um, in Ogden, Utah. And I just wanted to, um, I've been noticing that it's been very, very warm outside, um, not only in the daytime, but also in the evening. And um, people can tolerate some heat for some amount of time, um, but if they don't have the ability to cool down uh, for at least a, a good portion of either the day or the evening, um, there can be instances of heat stroke. Um, Uh, did you hit the mute button, Bonnie? Still talk. Bonnie, are you there? Hello. You, yes. You were muted there for a minute. And it talked a little bit. You're the last thing I remember hearing were people bad, bad reception. needed a chance to cool down. Is that kind of where we were? Oh, thank you. Yep. Sorry about this. Um, yeah, and just so I know that other um, communities and municipalities have worked with their health departments to um, establish cooling centers. And I'm wondering if there's um, any work here in Ogden um, to possibly set up cooling centers, uh, especially for the elderly or those that are low income that don't have air conditioning in their homes. OK, thank you. Um, We'll have someone address Thank that. You. Yep, we'll have someone address that after the public comment portion. Yes, please. Uh, Heath Sato, Hogan resident. Um, thanks for uh, considering that. I just want to make sure all the. It, 
last thing I want to do is get in the way of public art. I, I love the murals that are going up on Grant. They're, they're amazing. And I guess they're about done now, aren't they? Um, anyways, um, so I, I just want to make sure everybody looks at everything and we go across all our T's on that. Um, public art is a, is a, an important investment. Um, and, uh, what I originally had written down was, um, yeah, that I want, I want to get into this more later. Uh, but I did want to thank Brandon Cooper for sitting down with me for uh, three and a half hours and uh, spoke with. Uh, that was, I guess, a week ago um, about my concerns that had that up to that date had not been answered um, about the Brown Ice Cream Building development. Um, it took three months to get those answers. Uh, but it was well worth it, I think. Um, what I learned is that w we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> um, it won't fit into three minutes. Um, so I'm hoping to meet with a few city council members. I've already reached out to a couple of you, and I'll reach out to more. Um, I, I, I hope in the near future we can prioritize discussion of our public policy around the selection of developers. Uh, for our city property just as openly, honestly, and vigorously as we've debated the honorary naming of a street. Um, again, I'll be trying to set up some meetings with you guys shortly. Um, I would really appreciate every council member that is willing to discuss this issue at greater length. So thank you. Thank you. Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. Um, I want to talk about the fireworks ban, and I and um, I know y'all were as concerned as I am about fireworks. I live on the East Bench, and there are fireworks on the East Bench, regardless of the uh, limitations. And we back up to a huge fire hazard, as Ben has pointed, or excuse me, Councilman Dudelsky has pointed out, with all of that fuel up there, and. Um, well, I understand how the, the, the chief is operating according to what he believes is within his purview. I'd like to read a couple of names of cities in Utah right now that have a fireworks ban. And while I am not a lawyer, I know lots of people who are, and I asked them, and uh, a local municipality can take health and safety precautions if there is a legitimate public safety concern. And that is your loophole, that we are at this, uh, you know, red flag, level one, this is really dangerous. This is a public health hazard. And as Mr. Johnson has pointed out, it's going to cost. It's going to cost a lot. It's going to take available water from saving people's homes. We might have to shut our water system down. And, and, and I, I honestly don't believe I'm being too alarmist about this, considering our governor has done that state ban. So um, right now, today, uh, at 515, the Sandy City Council is discussing banning fireworks this evening. And uh, in Paranon, which is St. George's uh, area, they have banned all fireworks until 723, as well as Rockville, Springdale, New Harmony, Apple Valley, Diamond Valley, Elk Ridge, Hennifer, I'm going to completely mispronounce this, Scipio, S-C-I-P-I-O, I don't know how to say that. Scipio. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Never been there. Good. Colville City. Um, uh, and, and there are a list of cities that have really turned up the volume on their restrictions. And if the city and the council is uncomfortable going and leading like Sandy is and, and having an all out ban, well, let's just put some restrictions on it severely. For example, uh, Enoch has, uh, you can only light fire, fireworks in designated school parking lots, office building parking lots. I'm talking everything that's got a lot of concrete that doesn't have any natural area that's wide open. Uh, Enterprise City fireworks are banned within the city limits. So, um, you know, we are under a stage one restriction right now. And while I think that we should lead and ban them and follow the example of these other cities because it's going to cost us. Um, if not, then really 
Let's widen that restriction area um, to a very manageable area that can be concerned. And I 100% agree with Mr. Johnson that we have got to put some teeth behind it. People have to have fines and they have to hurt because there will be people, no matter what you do, that are going to do that. And that's going to help manage that. So, so please, um, really look into what you need to do to expand that region or do an all out ban and be a leader. You don't want Sandy to be a leader, do you? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more hands raised and I believe we've heard from our public here today. So, um, first off, I, maybe perhaps Mr. Johnson, you could go over, um, I know Priscilla Martinez asked about kind of a media plan or a media with, with the water shortage. Could, maybe you could address that in your comments. That would be great. Well, maybe we could also are, are we contacting the health department to see if there's any clean stations that they're setting up? Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Then we'll turn the time over to your administration. Thank you. Um, I do appreciate the comments that were made today. Um, we are working on a communication plan. Uh, we know that the next level of water restrictions is going to be probably the most difficult one. Um, unless we get to the to the last one, and then that won't be brutal. But we are working on communication plan how to get the word out. I think you had some great ideas about the churches and others, and so um, we will um, spend. In fact, as I think uh, Mr. McBride, our marketing uh, individuals, listening, and he'll be working on uh, the communication plan. But I think he'll incorporate what he heard you say today and others. We, we do need to get the word out and we need to get people to be compliant. Um, the thing I, I think I've liked the most that I've heard the governor say when it comes to the drought is that we need to make yellow lawns great again or something like that, which I think was an interesting quote. And, um, it's, it's true. I think, I think there'll be actually community shaming if your, your lawn's too green. And so, I mean, we need to keep things alive, but I think we can do that and still re save a lot of water. The cooling centers is a great idea. Um, I can't remember the lady's name that they told us that, but um, we are working right now with the Red Cross trying to put together that with our emergency manager to put cooling centers um, t together. We're working on that. Um, I don't know timelines, but I know, you know, we have facilities that we, we should be able to get them to be able to go to and cool down. So that's something that's on our list and something we're working on. And we know um, that's something that needs to happen. We're, we are concerned about the temperatures. And I don't think that this week will be an anomaly. Everything I'm seeing on the long-term forecasts are saying this is going to be a brutally hot year and dry year. So I think we're going to be facing this for a long time comment about the fireworks um we're more than happy to continue to have our legal people look what, what what's at risk is is lawsuits on the other side from the fireworks people they um they've spent and bought their allocations already they they want to be able to sell and to, so i mean we'll take a look and see what the other cities are doing uh, there's a big difference between ogden utah and uh, Scipio and enoch but Sandy, we have more in common with, and we'll watch very carefully what Sandy does and and um, see where it goes. I mean, my wishes, and I think I was quoted in the, from the work session last week saying, if I had a wish, it would be that we would ban fireworks this year. I think it's if there's ever a year to do it, it's this year. But I also worry about the enforcement of that because uh, we ban above Harrison fireworks every year, and I live above Harrison, and I guarantee you that I can go out on my porch and watch the fireworks show every year. And it's and it's just having the resources to be able to go and catch people and be able to cite them. And that's a, that's a difficult thing. So um, we're, we're hoping to do a blitz with people to just plead to their sense of, of reasonableness to be reasonable this year. It's, it's, it is a concern. It's both the water and how dry things are. So that was devastating last year. 
to have the fire at the mouth of the canyon. Um, I went up there and walked the entire fire route with the firefighters and saw how hard they were working, how uncomfortable they were in the heat with the, all their gear on and how much water we were putting down. And I was up there walking it with Justin Anderson, who was trying to figure out how to push enough water over to those reservoirs so that he could keep them in water. Um, he was pulling down as much water from the treatment plant as he could get. I um, mean, it, it is a terrifying thing to um, have those kinds of things happen. And not only did we lose vegetation, but we also lost um, Rocky Mountain Power, lost several poles. And there was power issues that they had to go in and take care of. And, and the last thing we need with this heat is to lose power around the city because that will uh, necessitate the need for more cooling stations. So, I mean, I hear you. We're... We're part of the co chorus. We just got to figure out how to do it and how to get our legal department there. They pay, we pay them to keep us out of court and out of lawsuits. And so we got to figure out how to get around the fireworks thing. I don't, I don't, we'll, we'll continue. I think that's the best I can do. All in all, I've really appreciated the comments tonight and, and, um, we'll, uh, we appreciate, um, people's, um, concern and we'll try and do our very best. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, comments from council members. I have a comment, if you don't mind. Please. We might as well just start here. No. Um, I just wanted to say, yeah, I appreciate all the public input and ideas that were shared. But also, one of my really big concerns, and I'm sure it's many other people's too, is the air quality. You know, I mean, with the heat, the fires, I mean, last summer was dreadful. The air quality was so terrible all across the West, right? And so I think if we, you know, maybe for some folks that's important because the fireworks don't help with that situation, but also the fire potential locally certainly doesn't either. And, and that really has a huge health impact overall, you know, thinking of cooling centers, but also the negative health effects of the air quality too. So I hope that people will please consider others and consider overall safety um, this summer too. Uh, Chair, I have a question about um, our last meeting. I brought up a water conservation idea and designated funding for that, and I just would like to know uh, if there was any discussion about that from anyone and maybe where we're at there. I know we discussed it in leadership. Um, yeah, I, I believe it's on the table. I don't know. I don't have any other. From from our side, we've been discussing it. We think it's a great idea. And I think we're trying to put together our thoughts on the idea and see if it compares to what you guys are thinking. But as far as the allocation of the funding, I know that was something that was time sensitive. So is that something that is going to be allocated now or not, I mean, I think that was the discussion we had last week. So were there any decisions made there? I was, I was proposing taking, pulling funding from the surplus that was presented to us and designating it for a water conservation program. So that was my specific recommendation. So was, was there any conversation about that or? We, we never landed on Janine, did we never landed on actually did not? So actually, you're, the the money in, that when you're calling surplus, the extra money that they were said it was already has already been appropriated. You already voted on that, but um, Mr. Johnson has said that there is some money available. Lisa's found some money, so I guess it's just up to you whether you want to uh, put it in this year's appropriate it now or uh, just have them hold it until we can get a project put together so that we have a better idea about what costs would be. So it's up to you. I guess I'd, I'd prefer that. I was getting caught up, asked Janine to send me the CIP again and re-review the conversation last week. Um, I was coaching softball again. We won. Thanks. I know you guys were worried. Undefeated. Anyway. I'd, I'd actually, I was looking at the CIP list and I don't, uh, 
it's hard to carve out a million bucks without having impacts that impact that affected my priorities too. But I, I like the idea, and I think uh, if there's alternative funding sources, I'd, I'd like to look at those instead. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like what we discussed in the work session. If you're in that same boat, um, I just I just have an idea. I don't. I just want to talk about options as to where we can fund it. Um, I'd like to do the same on that one if it's all right with you. I like the idea also, but uh, and I'd like to see the program and the uh, and the alternatives, the options that we have. I think that's very crucial to us to develop a, uh, a program along those lines. There, uh, the one thing about our fire and our water this year uh, in 2007. Uh, the council at that time bonded for improvements in the water system. At that time, we could not uh, transfer water from the north end to, this, uh, to the south end. We didn't have the capabilities of doing that. Plus, we had a 100-year-old pipe that was in the ground that we replaced, the 24-inch, that saves, uh, I think, 3 million gallons a day on that. And so... That helps us in in this time of drought that we have, but today because of our uh, uh, water work, our public works department going through and improving some of the pri pipes in the ground and some of the uh, storage units that we have, uh, we can transfer water from the north end to the south and from the south to the north. We have a better water system now in the city than than we, we've had in the past. Now, that doesn't, uh, that probably doesn't help us in a drought. It probably does help us in a drought, but we still are in a drought situation. But we've taken measures to improve on our water system that uh, hopefully uh, will pay benefits, especially in this time that we have a drought. Uh, I... Um, I'm also an advocate of, of arts. Uh, I think the arts is is the uh, creativity of our of our of our community, and uh, so I'm glad to see that we're moving ahead with with that plaza. But we want to have a plaza that's going to be safe, and I, I think that's most important aspect that we have. Um, and then we talked about a little bit about the June third uh, June team. Uh, it's this is a time to reflect and and uh, find out exactly uh, how far we've moved from the 1800s to the year 2021 in freedoms and relationships with individuals and, and groups. So I think that's an important event for us. Uh, I believe our dialogue tonight has been very productive. Uh, and as we are going into the budget session, uh, we're looking at in a couple of weeks we'll approve a budget, but that's the main uh, opportunity and responsibility that we have as a council to make sure that we have a, a budget. Now, maybe next year we need to lay, maybe look at the process of going through and developing the budget. We've brought up some questions that we could probably address in uh, future budget sessions that will greatly enhance our, uh, not only our departments and strengthen our departments, but also enhance and the, the opportunities for our employees. That's the main concern and priority I have for our budget this year, is to take care of our employees. They are the greatest asset that we have in the city. We can have many trucks, equipment, but the but the number one asset we have in the city is the assets of our employees, and we need to take care of them. Thank you. I just had a, I, I wanted to follow up I, uh, I, what Bonnie said about cooling centers. Is the um, Golden Hours open, and ha they have... Air conditioning, I'm assuming. They do have air conditioning. Um, they officially open Golden Hours and Marsha Wyatt on July 6th, I believe. July we could 6th? Yeah, we could open it maybe earlier, but they do have air conditioning. 
I don't know how good it is, but they do have it. <laughs> you might think about that. And yeah, we've we've looked at that. We've looked at other. We have emergency locations that are set for different emergencies. So I have an idea. You go into the library, you'd read a book. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I just want to thank everybody for being here, making their comments. I think that um, it's fun to be back in the chambers and actually see people and touch people and <laughs> <laughs> and sanitize after. And, right. <laughs> yeah, so. Anyways, thank you. I'm all, I don't know if I'd go as far as say fun, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, just to add to my comments about uh, what we were talking about with Louisa's proposal, we still have an option to, I mean, there's a lot of ideas, I'm sure there are, but um, I think what you're referring to is the surplus funds. Those were monies that we appropriated before we, you know, hit the end of the fiscal year and we roll over more than what state law will allow as a maximum. And so that maximum and minimum, I. 10 and 35 or whatever it is in, in law, you know, we're bumping up against the maximum. That's a really good problem to have. And I was, as I was catching up and thinking about it, I was like, we call that a rainy day fund and, and it'd be kind of appropriate, I suppose, to, to use it for the drought, you know, water related. <laughs> Lack of rainy yeah. But that's why we, that's why we try to put ourselves in that fiscal position too. So if that's your intention, I think we have other avenues we can do it too without impacting those projects that are um, ongoing too. So. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I I appreciate that. I might. I I just I just hope that if it's um, as important to many of us uh, as it is to me, then you know we just we just prioritize it and follow through with it as mm -hmm. um, you know as 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 our conscience. <laughs> tell us how important this is and we just don't let it slide. Um, so I'm not in leadership, so I don't have the ability to uh, talk about what's going to be in the agenda and how to prioritize things to be in the agenda. But if I were, this would be one of them because um, we can ban fireworks everywhere, but we can have, we can do this, which is what we're talking about now. We can appropriate the funding uh, to, 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 lead and to show our community and to uh, do things that are going to have a very a positive impact in our in our conservation efforts uh, uh, hopefully in the short run and, and 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 in the long in the long in the future as well so so I just I just hope that uh, uh, if if the majority feels that sense of urgency that we act that we act on it and, and you know that's that's my 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 request. I, I don't. I think everybody wants to act on it. It's just that there's not a program to act on. I mean, is it a billion dollars? Is it two million dollars? Is it one? And, you know what I mean. So let, let's find out the program first and try to come up with that, and then. Sure. Yeah. If, that's if that's, what I think. If I don't that's, think. I mean, it's only been a week, so. Sure. 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 Yeah. You know, we move pretty slow here. <laughs> okay. But we did talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I know. Understand where you're coming from. I, I agree. I agree. I don't want to. Let's not stop, right? That's the that's the concern, and you know the urgency is now because we're in an urgent situation, but the urgency is not enough to get all those answers by the next week either. So, I just hope that it's not that many weeks before we're back, right? You know, with with the answer because. I totally agree. This is that's an urgent moment that requires our leadership. So. so, just one other comment: Can we find out who has the authority to ban uh, uh, fireworks within our city? I I actually do think it is the governor able to do that. So I don't know if that's a you you started off the conversation of would it be good to send him a yeah a chat no and, and my comment was just. Dovetail into that thread, email thread we had about the topic. You had yeah. discussions in the League of Cities and Towns, and, and so I'm sure there are different authorities in different areas, and, and a little bit of clarity there would be great, but it would be nice to add our voice to the to the chorus that's asking for that. <laughs> and maybe it is a city. I don't know. But, so like maybe we could find that needed. out. Yeah. Thanks.
Chair, are you you ready for uh, some remote talking here? Yes, please. Um, I, I apologize for not being present uh, tonight, and I've seen my my mug on that uh, little monitor at the Diaz there, or the at the podium, and I look like the great and powerful Oz. So I'll try not to let that happen again. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to what Luis said. I think it is something that we need to keep on the radar. We need to follow through with a, a program that, uh, that, that assists our citizens in, in becoming more water conscious. Um, we, we had somebody that, uh, emailed us last week that, that misunderstood what we were trying to say. And, and I'd, I, I want to be clear that I'm not talking about any kind of a stick approach to to this water uh, conservation program. You know, we 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 may come to that with if there's no water to put in the system. But we, uh, but in the meantime, I think we need to encourage people as best we can uh, to to be conscious of of their own water use inside and out. Um, I've driven around a lot, seen a lot of lawns that are kind of looking a little, a little tired. And, and, you know, to everybody's credit, it's people, some people that, that they never had anything but a beautiful green lawn before are being conscientious and, and uh, minimizing the amount of water they put on the lawn. And I appreciate that. I, I think that's, uh, that is really good news. And anyway, let's, let's keep going forward. Let's, uh, you know, this budget thing is not easy. It's, you know, whatever you do somewhere, you don't do somewhere else. It's just a difficult thing sometimes. And I'm mindful and cognizant of that. Um, but, but let's keep talking and, and listening to their, our constituents. And, and uh, I think we can make the best choices as we, as we keep dialogue open. And that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. If there's no further comments, I would entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. Uh, we have a motion to adjourn by Councilman Nadolski and a second by Councilman Chaburka. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes. Thank you, everybody.